Hello everyone, welcome to another session for our Nabart exam for ERT section. And for today's video, uh, we're going to continue with our soil science and water conservation. So for today, we're going to talk uh, for where we have left the part one and we're going to continue with our part two. My name is Hansa Nora and I've been a mentor for your Nabart ERD section. And please don't forget to subscribe to the channel as well as press the bell icon and if you like the video, Please don't forget to hit the like button as well as share with your friends. Alright, so uh, first and foremost, we are gonna today we're gonna start off with our fertilizers and its classification. So to understand, we need to um, know what these fertilizers are, right? So fertilizers can be defined as a matter or a material uh, or a substance which can be used to make the soil more fertile. And these can be such as manures or fertilizers of nitrates, right? It can be organic as well as inorganic. It is applied on the soil to plant tissue, uh, which can uh, be supplied one or more plant nutrients for the essential growth of the plants, right? And the manures, manures, these are supply, they supply plant nutrients in small quantities, but they supply um, the organic matter in larger quantities. So an example for this would be your, it would be FYM, right? So these will give a lesser amount of plant nutrients, but this will give you a higher amount of organic matter. So uh, some of the examples of organic matter will be vermicompost. Uh, vermicompost is a compost that is uh, made with the help of earthworms, right? And we have another so uh, manure no known as night soil. And night soil, these are formed or these are made from the cumin excreta, can be uh, both solid or liquid. And uh, these are all about the manures and going to the green manure. Green manure, these are green under de un decomposed plant material which are used as manure. And this green manure can be in situ or ex situ. And in situ, these are the green manures or the manures with where the plants, these are grown along with their main crop. And after, they, uh, after the life cycle of that green manure is over, they are left out there to decompose by itself. So some of the examples for this in situ type of green manures would be Sesbania uh, and Sunham. So these two properties make a really good um, in situ green manures. Whereas in ex situ, it's a complete opposite of that. So we do not grow the plant or the green manures along with the main crop, but instead we will take the plant debris or the plant material or the leaves and the twigs and collect it and we will put it on top of the um, main crop. So some of the examples for this would be your Glyrocidia, or Neem, Fungina. These are some of the examples for this green manure. So some of the terminologies for you all to, uh, that I've jotted down here are on deficient. So when a, when a plant is deficient, then it's, it means that the concentration of an essential element is low enough to limit yields severely and distinct deficiency symptoms can be shown in the uh, plant or which, is, which becomes visible. Right, so it can be ranges from some less, uh, more, less or moderately, slightly moderately deficiency symptoms. And in critical range, the nutrient concentration in the plant is below which the yield responds to as nutrient occurs. Right, and this, uh, the critical level or the range vary among plants and nutrients, but occurs somewhere in a transition between the nutrient and sufficiency. So what is the sufficient? So sufficient is when the nutrient concentration is sufficient enough or which is um, perfect enough to for the plant to sustain but which will not increase the yield, all right? And the term luxury consumption is often used to describe nutrient absorption by the plant that does not influence any yield. So and here in excessive or toxic, when the, when the concentration or the essential element or the minerals these are high enough to reduce the plant growth and yield. Excessive nutrient uh, concentration can also cause an imbalance in the plant and this reduces the yields and the food set or the food crop and it can also cause in the physiological disorders of these plants. So it is very important to know all these terms. Right, so these fertilizers can be classified into six categories, right? So 
here we have a straight fertilizers, we have complex fertilizers, we have mixed fertilizers, complete fertilizers, low analyzers fertilizers, and high analyzers fertilizers. So the straight fertilizers are the fertilizers where the fertilizers, they supply only one major nutrient, right? An example for this would be urea, right? And other than, uh, on the other hand, complex fertilizers are the fertilizers which supply more than two or, well, which supply two or more than two uh, major nutrients. An example for this or would be your DAP, right? And your mixed fertilizers, mixed fertilizers are the products or the fertilizers made by mixing two primary, it can be two or two or more primary uh, nutrients, major nutrients. But an example for this is again DAP. And in complete fertilizers, in complete fertilizers, these are a product or a fertilizer where these are made by mixing of the three major primary nutrients. Example for this would be your NPK, where all the all the major three main nutrients are supplied in one as one single fertilizer. Right, so here in low analyzers fertilizers, in low analyzers fertilizers, these are fertilizers which have a less having less than 25% of the primary nutrients. An example for this would be SSP, single superphosphate, and in, whereas in high analyzers, it is an opposite, uh, it's a fertilizer or product where it has more than 25% of the major nutrients. Right, an example for this would be your urea. So these are the different types or the classification of fertilizers. Now let's move on to the methods or of application of these fertilizers. Uh, fertilizers are can be applied on uh, three methods. All right, the basal dose, the basal dose or the basal method of application here, uh, the fertilizers or the pesticides, these are applied at the sowing time. And deep placement of fertilizers, these are mostly done in rice, where the ammonium, the wet ammonium incorporated in reduced zone zone to prevent the leaching right and in starter dose starter dose here these are mostly done in legumes as well as the vegetables where the npk these are applied at their transplanting and they are usually done at the ratio of one is two two is to one right and your split dose split dose of nitrogen fertilizers these can be of two types uh, and a, a two split dose or three split dose. These are mostly done to increase the nitrogen efficiency in the crop and uh, two split dose are mostly done where the crop's uh, duration would be around four months. Whereas in three split doses, uh, where the duration of the crop is for more than uh, five to six months. Right, so these are the uh, simple, uh, these are the simple methods of application of these fertilizers. Uh, let's go to our biofertilizers. What are biofertilizers, right? Or these are also known as bioinoculants. So these biofertilizers are preparations which contain microorganisms that supply nutrients, especially nitrogen, phosphorus to these plants. And these can be supplied to the plants through soil inoculum, through your uh, plant, as well as in the form of a compost. And what the main objective of bio of fertilizers would be that it will increase the efficiency of its microorganisms or it will increase the microorganisms and thereafter accelerate the microbial activity and this will in turn augment the, um, the ability the availability of these uh, plant nutrients and which will make it available for the plants so they make a really perfect um, type of uh, microbial soil biology in the soil which will make it very beneficial for the plants as well as the soil right and these are 
and some of the advantages of these biofertilizers are cost effective. It's cost effective because it is it needs lesser money or it does not cost as much as those inorganic fertilizers where we where we spend a lot of money on it. Right, and the supplements to the fertilizers I've, I've already discussed with you since it can act as a supplement of fertilizers as it will increase the microbial activity and uh, therefore it will also it will increase the proper uh, production and uh, life inside the soil. So this can be a uh, supplement to the fertilizers and it is also eco-friendly because uh, it is friendly with nature and it does not pollute or it does not have any residues unlike the organic fertilizers where they're these are mostly toxic and they can be they can reside in the soil for years and lots of years and they can pollute the soil as well as even the groundwater and can go to the river banks and the streams as well as can, it can also uh, affect the human health whereas in this biofertilizers these are environmental friendly biodegradable and in such a way that they, they do not have any environmental impact Right, and it reduces the cost towards fertilizers use. We've already, it's, since it's cost effective, definitely it's going to reduce the cost towards the fertilizer use, especially regarding nitrogen and phosphorus. Since these biofertilizers, they are very famous for nitrogen and phosphorus fixation. These biofertilizers, they make these un uh, unavailable nitrogen and phosphorus in the soil available for the plant in the soil by fixing the nitro nitrogen and the phosphorus. Right, so um, based on the nutrient supply, these biofertilizers can be classified into two types, mainly the nitrogen fixing compounds as well as the phosphorus fixing compounds. So in, uh, these, are, these nitrogen fixing compounds can be further divided into free living, associated, symbiotic and symbiotic. So free living can be further again divided into aerobic and anaerobic. In anaerobic acetobacterium, these are the free fixtures they can these are mostly used for uh, wheat rice cotton and sugarcane in an anaerobic we have as a spirulum whereas in uh, associative symbiotic we have clostridium and so for uh, your associative symbiotic we are going to use as a spirulum and as a spirulum, these are associated with the roots of grasses. And some of the examples of the crops would be sorghum and pearl millet. So these are the examples of this as a spirulum. And as a spirulum, a nitrogen fixation. And for symbiotics, in symbiotic we have uh, two types again, which is nodule formation. And on the nodal formation, which one will come? It'll be rhizobium. And rhizobium, they have a symbiotic relationship or they have the nitrogen fixtures of all the legumes, right? And uh, we also have a non nodule formation. And for this, we have a blue green algae, which is also known as, and uh, these have a symbiotic relationship or the association with a water fern known as Azola pinata, right? So these are some of the free living, uh, some of the nitrogen fixing compounds, right? And we're gonna move on to our phosphorus. Phosphorus, there are two types. First one is the phosphate soluble solubilizer, and the second one is phosphate absorber. So this phosphate solubilizer, these are mostly used in the soils where they are a higher amount or a lot of people when when there is an immense use of this uh, immense use of it. NPK and DAP, DAP is used then it increases the sulfate and the phosphate residues so to solubilize this phosphorus these phosphate uh, solubilizer is used right and uh, we're going to go to our soil nutrients Basically, according to Arnon and Stout, we have 16 essential nutrients. And with this, we can uh, group them. We have another plus 16 essential nutrients plus one, which is nickel, right? So that makes about the 17 nutrients. So out of these, three would be your basic structures, basic nutrients, which will be CHO, carbon hydrogen, which will be NPK. And we'll be having a secondary group, which will be calcium, magnesium, and sulfur, and the rest will be your micronutrients.
nutrients. So under this, we have three primary, right? And some all of them discuss nitrogen and sulfur, they will be your secondary and the rest will be your micronutrients. So here in this uh, diagram, in this table, I've given the element as well as the function in the plant. Let's just go in detail with each and all, uh, uh, each one of these. So this nitrogen, they are responsible for the vegetative growth and the building block. These are the building block protein in the plant. Whereas in phosphorus, these are critical. And remember, these are nitrogen for the vegetative growth and this phosphorus, they are crucial for the root development. Remember this and for crop maturity and seed production. And potassium, these are deactivate enzymes. These are important to plant for withstand extreme temperature as well as drought. And boron, these are important in sugar transport, cell division, and amino acid production. Chloride, they use in turgor regulations, resisting diseases, as well as photosynthetic reactions. Copper, on the other hand, they are important components of enzymes involved in photosynthesis again. Iron, component of enzymes, essential for photosynthesis, as well as photosynthesis. Molybdenum, involved in the nitrogen metabolism, essentially nitrogen fixation. Manganese, chloroplast production, cofactor in many plant reactions, deactivate the enzymes as well. And the last C, we have zinc. These are the components of many enzymes essential for plant hormone balance and oxygen activity. So remember all the functions of these elements. It's very important to know the functions because even when the deficiency symptoms also come, and if they're going to ask you on different symptoms, it's going to be much more easier for you all to answer this if you understand the basic and the functions of all of these elements, right? And uh, here in this picture, I've just given a diagram to representation of the plant as long as where these essential, well, where all these micro, macro and micronutrients will be attacking the uh, micro and micronutrients deficiency symptoms will be shown. Right, so from, we're going to go from this side and then we're going to go to the right hand side. So we're going to start off with the left hand side. First is boron. And boron, there will be here, as you can see in this picture, there is going to be a discoloration of leaf buds and breaking and dropping of the buds. Remember this? And sulfur here, there's going to be a light green veins, vein pale gray, and there will be any spots. So basically, it's going to show a symptom of chlorosis, but there won't be any spots and the veins will be pale green and the leaves will turn light green or it can even turn yellow, right? And manganese, the leaves, they are pale in color, veins and ven venules, they are dark green and articulate. So remember, in sulfur, all of the veins and everything will turn pale green and yellow, but whereas in manganese, it's only the leaves that will turn pale in color, but the veins and the venules they will still remain dark green okay and in zinc leaves are pale narrow short veins dark green they have dark spots on leaves as well as on the edges and these are the symptoms of zinc manganese paleness from leaf edges there are no spots edges have cut shaped holes leaves die and drop in extreme and deficiency right and phosphorus they have the plants Short and dark green in extreme and deficiencies turn brown or black bronze color under the leaves. So bronzing will have occur in your phosphorus. And we'll move on to the calcium. Calcium will get still gonna have a plant will be still dark green. Tender leaves will be pale during charts or from the tip eventually leaf front and die, right? So uh if you can see the boron and calcium, they attack the uppermost or the topmost layer, uh, topmost part of the plant. And for iron, iron have a major pale leaves and they have no spots, but major veins will be green. Okay. And copper, we have pale green between the veins, wilt and drop. So in copper, the the extra addition, other than paleness, the most important way to identify it is due to wilting and drooping of the leaves okay and molybdenum the leaves they're light green lemon yellow orange spots on the whole leaf except being sticky secretions from under the leaf so molybdenum they, other than that other than they also give out uh, give out the sticky secretions uh, as well as they have spots on the leaves 
and potassium, they have small spots on the leaves, edges of the pale leaves, spots will turn rusty, holes at the tip. So this will be your symptoms for potassium. And nitrogen, the stunted growth, extreme pale color, upright leaves, the light green yellowish, and they appear burnt in extreme deficiencies. So these are the different types of the deficiency symptoms shown by these different elements. All right. This is a really good diagrammatic view, which which makes it much more easier and clearer, right? And so, if you want, you can take a screenshot of this as well. So here in this in this slide, we're going to talk about some of the plants which can be used as an indicator for the nutrient deficiencies. And the deficient elements here I've given on the left hand side, and the indicator plants I've given on the cauliflower. So why are they call the indicator plants? They are also called the indicator plants because they are susceptible or they're less tolerant to the deficient, deficiencies of these elements, right? So even if there's a slightest deficiency or slightest less, lesser in amount of all these nutrients, then this cross will show the first symptoms. And so that's why they are called the indicators. So first and foremost, for the nitrogen, it's always the cauliflower and cabbage. Phosphorus, we have rape seeds or mustard. And potassium is potatoes. Calcium, cauliflower, and cabbage again. Magnesium is potatoes, iron, cauliflower, cabbage, potato, as well as oats. Sodium, we have sugar beet, manganese, sugar beet, and oat. Boron, we have sunflower. So these are the sudden crops which are the plant indicators for this nutrient deficiency, right? Let's go to our another topic which is soil erosion. So what is soil erosion? Soil erosion, it is a naturally occurring process that affects the land forms. So in agriculture, this soil erosion can be caused due to water as well as wind. And what happens here is that there will be a wearing of the topmost soil of the uh, land and uh, it can, which are really caused by wind or water and through this and as well as even farming activities as well as tillage can also affect this soil erosion and within time the soil the topmost layer of the soil will be worn off and will be deposited somewhere so this is known as erosion and these detachment movement and deposition these are the three steps of soil erosion all right and here in detachment this so uh, this is when the top soil is actually detached from the rest of the ground for example i'm going to take an example of the water or the raindrops if the water the raindrops it falls on the land then the small particles or the sand they will get detached and the movement will start and they will move to another so another area and there is going to get deposited so this whole process is you no know, uh, this, this whole process come, uh, comes under your soil erosion okay so uh there are main two methods or the main two causes for the soil erosion the first one is water erosion as well as the sulfur surface water runoff these are two important terms which come in time and time right and on the main causes of soil erosion water erosion which is the loss of the topsoil due to the water so here in water erosion as i already explained in the previous slide the raindrops they fall directly on the topsoil the impact of the raindrops loosen the material bonding it together allowing some fragments to detach right and in the rainfall and these surface water run runoff is actually a, a extreme form of this water erosion and if the water or the rainfall they continue the water gathers on the ground they cause water flow on the land surface and which is known as the surface water runoff and this runoff carries the detached soil materials away and deposit them elsewhere right so these are the main two causes of soil erosion and let's talk more about the causes of other causes of soil erosion the first one here is rain and water runoff we've already discussed in the previous slide so we're not going to talk here uh, anymore about the rain and water runoff so rain and water runoff we've already discussed in the previous slide and these rain and water runoff suppose if it's just uh, if it's just like water erosion then it's gonna take out most of your organic materials and your uh, clay or the silt or the sandy particles, smaller particles. But if there's a, a extreme water runoff, then it can also take off your uh, take off the uh, important and the more um, 
heavier organic minerals or the minerals or the elements as well. And farming, farming can also uh, cause can be also be a cause for the soil erosion, as it can always farming intensive farming can also change the um, the soil structure. And even though it will hold it, but eventually it will also deplete the organic material from that soil, and therefore it, it's going to deteriorate the soil due to higher tillage practices. The soil will also become less will become more porous and they won't be any having any more aggregates to hold the soil and in that way which will make it much more easier for it to um, fall under soil erosion right and slope of the land is also important uh, as the if the slope of the land is much more higher than if we're going to compare this to the slope of the land like this then the runoff due to the pressure and due to the slope the runoff in the number one is going to be more higher than the runoff in this slope. So this will cause a higher, uh, this will also cause in the, or this can also affect the soil erosion. In the lack of vegetation, since if, there, if the land is barren and if there's no vegetation in the land, the, the roots, they actually help in holding the soil together uh, and that's why in more of the barren lands or in the places where there's no vegetation soil erosion is more as they become more um, susceptible they become more exposed to these water runoff as well as the water erosion as well as the wind erosion right and the last one here is on wind erosion wind erosion can also take a part in soil erosion as this wind erosion uh, it depends on the velocity of the wind if it's like uh, lesser velocity then it won't affect the soil much but if it's at the high velocity then definitely it can translocate the smaller particles of the soil and thereby causing soil erosion to some greater extent right so these are some of the causes of this soil erosion and let's go to our types of soil erosion we have different types of soil erosion we have splash erosion rill erosion gully erosion stream bank erosion deposition sheet erosion these are some of the types of soil erosion so let us discuss all of these type of erosion in detail the soil erosion these are these are also known as the splash erosion and here this is the most simplest uh, form of erosion or this is also known as the water erosion right and here Suppose the rain droplets or the water droplets will form on the ground and due to the pressure or the force, these particles, these are rather transported and this look at this it into a different uh, areas so maybe and there are they are definitely going to accumulate in this region. And so this is the main uh, formation of the process of the raindrop or the splash erosion. And these are the most simplest methods of the soil erosion and these are the most common methods common soil erosion and here we have a sheet erosion sheet erosion these are mostly caused by wind erosion and these are mostly found in a flat surface as you can see here right and due to the wind erosion due to the continuous wind with a higher velocity the the soil particles or the land particles these are uh, actually getting detached and translocated to a different area and so it makes a sheet like structure here and which makes it sheet like structures out here and so these are the type of soil another type of soil erosion which are caused by wind erosion and the sheet erosion is the most uh, it's not common and cannot be diagnosed properly as well so let's go to our real erosion real erosion these are again caused due to water erosion Due to heavy rains or due to the continuous rain, this will form a small channel or a rill like structures due to the water and this will be making a small rill or channels. But then this can be uh, this can be amended or this can be reclaimed by a tillage, right? And so these are the types of rill erosion and which will form a rill shape, right? And the gully erosion, this is an advanced form of real erosion, right? And here in this gully erosion, the 
the rills or the the ridges they are more wide and more deeper the cracks are more deeper and more wider right and these are due to the continuous water runoff uh, due to heavy rains which causes over time a uh, huge deep cracks and ridges like these and this will be your gully erosion so let's just not any use in this type of erosion right so here uh in our stream bank erosion the stream bank erosion these are usually caused due to uh, the stream or the river sites right so because of this continuous flow of this river the sides of the land or the side of the soil these are also washed off continuously and so this this causes this stream bank erosion so these are some of the types of soil erosion we also have wind erosion which we already discussed we also have a tunnel erosion in the tunnel erosion these are also caused due to droplets or the rainfall suppose this is in land or an area and due to the continuous uh, raindrops this will form a small hole out here at first and with the continuous droppage continuous droppage these are going to these are going to go deeper and deeper and eventually they are going to form a tunnel shape so this is another type of soil erosion right okay so uh, some of the solutions for the soil erosion can be your careful tilling because a tillage activity they break up the soil structure so doing less of tillage uh, actually a no tillage is the most preferable method for solution or for these soil erosion right so if we don't do not do have if you do not do any tillage practices then it's much more beneficial to prevent the soil erosion and crop rotation crop rotation plenty of crop rotation they are also crucial as uh, when we go for crop rotation we will be en uh, encountering different types of soils uh, root structures which will definitely change the structure of these soil from time to time whereas in an intensive cropping the soil becomes very it will deplete the soil and it will definitely change the soil so it will definitely change the soil structures when we look it into um, the intensive or the intensive monoculturing right and these will allow this crop rotation will also allow the organic matter to build up and which will make it further planting is more fertile and thus it will help in the soil erosion as the soil will be more compact and more clay in that way it will not have a uh, more of the sandy or broken pets of the sandy gates and for increased soil increased structure of the plants uh, introducing terraces or other means of stabilizing or the soil can help in solution it can help in preventing the soil erosion for example in a top uh, undulated topography for in hills or uh, terrains then if you go for this contour or terrace farming then it will change the whole topography of the land in such a way that due to the water runoff due to the rainfall as well they will not be displaced the soil will not be detached or displaced from it right and we have another called water control for those areas where the soil erosion is predominantly caused by water uh, whether the nat whether it's natural or the man-made man -made, then the specialized uh, runoff pipes can also help direct these water sources away from these susceptible areas so we're going to use some of the structures when it's a water pipe or the tanks which will divert it from the uh, most susceptible or the most prominent area where it's more susceptible to all this soil erosion and then we're going to divert its way or the water sources and for the uh, increased knowledge a major factor of preventing soil, uh, soil erosion is when you increase the knowledge of uh, of each other as well as create awareness amongst each other and teach the farmers and as well as the people around so that people will be more aware of it and we can come up with a definitely better uh, solution practices for the soil erosion and uh, moving on to our last chapter which is of the soil conservation soil and water conservation the first and foremost we're going to, going to talk about soil conservation what is a soil conservation and why is it important to conserve soil since soil is the most dynamic and a diverse um, material that we can found in earth and which is the living ground for all the plants and for all the living organisms on earth it is important for us to conserve the soil if the soil 
it's not there. The soil is actually the food for all these plants. So it's very important to conserve the soil. Uh, so soil conservation can also can be defined as preventing of the soil loss from erosion or reduce the fertility caused by overusage, acidification, salinization, or in other chemical soil contaminations. So this is the definition of your soil conservation, right? And it is a name which is given to techniques which aims at preserving the soil, right? So other than that, we have different techniques to conserve the soil. Some of the techniques here are contour flowing, and in contour flowing is a type of farming practices where it is uh, plowing or the planting. These are done across the slopes in elevation contour lines, right? So suppose this is a hilly region and the contour plowing or the contour farming we're going to do more of it this side. So it's going to form a contouring in this way. And this will definitely help in preventing the water uh, soil erosion. So this is definitely a plus sign for the soil conservation. And terrace farming, terrace farming, these are also a method of flat levels and areas in hills. Uh, it's mostly practiced in the Asian countries for cultivation of rice. Right, so even here, it's the same as the contour, but it's more of a straight line, whereas in contour, it can be in the slopey area as well. But here in terrace, we're, we make a step-like structure or the terrace, and this will form into a terrace farming, right? And this will also help in the um, reducing the soil and water erosion. And key line design, these are more enhanced version of contour flowing. But here, what we do here is that we take a two different ideas, that is watershed management as well as the contour plowing. So we will be making the contour and the ridges in such a way that the water sources will be, uh, watershed properties will be uh, taken into consideration. Maybe the water runoff will be run down to a particular water resources. So this is a key line design, right? And we're going to talk about perimeter runoff control. This is a part practice of planting trees or the shrubs, ground covers according to the perimeter of the farmland, which impedes surface flow and keep nutrients in the farm soil, right? So we're going to talk about windbreaks. Windbreaks are nothing but, uh, it's also called the shelter, break, shelter breaks or hedgerow systems. This is a very famous system or particular practice which is done in the agricultural system. So this is a field and you plant a particular tree on the sides like this, which will act as a shield and which can break the wind. So suppose these are actually good for preventing wind erosion as these trees or these shrubs can prevent uh, can act as a barrier for this wind, higher wind velocity, and it will direct the wind velocity from the from the field from the main crop, and so the main crop will remain uninjured. The soil also will be free from this wind erosion. Right. Other than this, it has also have it also have various uh, so many different benefits, such as it will also help in the evapotranspiration. I will reduce the transpiration rate of the soil, of, of the plant as well, as well as it can also protect the soil from uh, other dust and other pollutants and as it will act as a barrier. So other than that, it can also act as a fodder and can uh, give an extra income to the community. It can give a habitat for the wildlife as well. So these are some of the advantages and benefits of the windbreaks. And we, uh, moving on, we have cover crops and crop rotation. Cover crops and crop rotation, of course, these cover crops, they will act uh, as uh, the crops or the cover crops can be grown along with the main crop and these can uh, hold, the, hold the soil properly and these cover crops, these are high in nitrogen which will be beneficial for the soil and which will help in the fertility of the soil. As well as crop rotation also, it will help in the fertility, increasing the fertility of the soil as well as it will hold the crop, it will definitely change the structure of the soil and it won't make the soil so compact which will make it also friable and which will make it more uh, the aeration will also be better in this type of soil which will give the whole dynamic uh, uh, whole dynamic biology of the soil proper and it will give them a really perfect soil 
So for soil another method is a soil conservation of farming. It is a mixture of a farming method which intends to mimic the biology of a virgin land. So soil conservation farming is a farming method where we duplicate or mimic perfect virgin land where there is a land, a virgin land would be a land or a forest where there no other human activities has been done or new agriculture uh, crops have been planted or where it's been living as it is. So, so this soil conservation farming is a very is a very typical good farming method to preserve the soil, right? And we furthermore we have an astrological measures. These are planting grasses in heavily encoded areas, and it's known as these agroecological measures. So here we just plant. It can be incorporated along the trees as well. And the grass grasses are mostly planted in the areas, or it can also be planted. And these grasses can also be used as a fodder for these livestock and animals as well, right? So we have a no-till farming. We've already discussed about the no-tillage. So because uh, if there are if we go for more tillage practices, then it will definitely loosen up the soil, and which will in turn uh, increase the chances of soil erosion, right? But if there is no till or no till farming, then this can it can be very helpful in increasing the uh, increasing the organic material as well as increasing the uh, compactness of the soil, and so that it will be less uh, damaged by the tillage property. And so this is a method which in which of growing crops year round without changing the topography of the soil. So the topography of the soil won't be changed at all because since if you do the tillage, then definitely it's going to change the whole structure of the soil. And uh, the, here we have earthworms as well. Earthworms, as we all know, that they are very good for uh, soil as they give a better aeration in the soil, right? So they provide, a, uh, they burrow, they, they burrow underground and they live underground, which will make it more available for the water and the oxygen to go about in the soil and. Uh, they will be able to infiltrate in the soil better, right? And the Korean natural farming, this is a method that takes advantage of the natural as well as indigenous microorganisms to produce a fertile soil that, in, that yields higher output and get rid of the need of the herbicides or the pesticides, right? So we have a, a rain gardens. A rain garden is a shallow depression in the land which holds and collects rainwater from impervious surfaces and they prevent erosion while saving the nutrients that inevitably that inevitably they get washed away. So this is about rain gardens and re-establishing forest cover, a dense amount of trees or the forest covers, these are mostly planted and uh, planted again and the network of the deep roots of a long term solution to the soil erosion. Right, so these uh, another benefit for this can also be the windbreak, which we have also discussed in the previous slide, that the trees can provide. Right, so these, when we re-establish the forest cover, definitely is going to help in increasing the whole uh, micro, it will increase the microbial activity, as well as it will increase the microorganisms in the soil, which will help in the benefit, in benefiting the soil. And indigenous crops, why are indigenous crops better than <coughs> non-indigenous crops? As indigenous crops, if we're going to grow the indigenous crop in that particular area, we don't have to put any extra amount or, or any extra, extra <coughs> <coughs> any extra organic, any extra elements or minerals as they are more neutral to that part of the soil and definitely it's going to adapt well to that part of the soil and put up that soil and land so it will also definitely will regain its naturally it's going to regain its uh, regain its own soil formation as well as it's going to help in preventing the soil erosion as well as it will improve the soil structure and the soil texture as well as in, and improve the soil orga organic matter. So uh, that's all about the soil conservation. Let let us move on to this watershed management. And what is watershed management? Watershed management is a concept which regulates indigenous management of basic resources, that is soil, water, vegetation, by implementing land use practices and water management practices to protect and improve the quality of the water 
and the natural resources within a watershed by managing the use of these lands and water resources in a comprehensive manner. So these are the definition of watershed management. So what is so before going to the watershed management, we understood what a watershed management is, and now what is a watershed? So usually a uh, every body of the water, be it rivers, lakes, streams, ponds, even your estuaries. Uh, it can also be in the form of a precipitation, rain and snow from the high mountains, right? And these, they form a watershed or they can be called as a watershed. So a watershed is basically the area of land that drains or sheds water into a specific preceding water body such as lake or a river. So both the watershed, these can be a bodies of watersheds that can come in the form of rivers, lakes, ponds, streams, and streams from the high mountains in the form of rain, the snow as well, and all of these they will combine into a part, they will join into a particular point, maybe in a, like a funnel shape, right? So all of these will come to one point in a funnel shape, and from the drop by drop, they are going to go to a, a larger air in, uh, in a, into a larger lakes or rivers or into a larger water body and therefore they're going to go back to the oceans and, and the seas right so all these will these are known as the watershed right right so there are type different types of watershed these type of watershed these are uh, based on the uh, size the drainage properties and the shape as well as the land pattern Right, so uh, there are five types of watershed, which is a macro watershed, sub watershed, milli watershed, micro watershed, and mini watershed. So it's important to remember the area of all these of these watersheds. Okay, so for macro watershed, these are more than fifty thousand hectares. <coughs> sub watershed would be around ten thousand to fifty thousand hectares. Milli watershed would be about thousand to ten thousand. Micro watershed would be hundred to thousand. And mini would make about 100 to 100, 1 to 100 hectares. Right, so that's all for soil science and water conservation. Uh, please don't forget to subscribe. And if you've liked this session, please don't forget to hit the like button. As well as, as, well as share with your friends. And uh, we'll be meeting in the next session. And we're going to talk about fisheries in the next session. So please be there. And thank you so much and stay safe.